Judges chapter 7 and 8 tonight. We're going to finish the account of Gideon. Gideon's the fifth judge out of the 13 judges that's recorded in the book of Judges. And so Gideon is from the tribe of Manasseh, as we talked about last week. We covered that first chapter last week, the call. And so now we're going to finish up this account of Gideon. Now remember, think of these judges as warriors, men and women raised up to deliver Israel from one of their enemies in the land. Okay, so I want you to remember that, that these judges, they're not leaders over the entire nation of Israel like Moses and Joshua. They're just ones that are brought up in the different vicinities of Israel as they've entered the land. You have the different tribes that have possessed the land. And so we see that Gideon is from the tribe of Manasseh. Now, remember Israel was supposed to fully possess the land when they came in under Joshua and totally eradicate the inhabitants in the land, but they never finished the job. And so that's how we landed up in this time of the book of Judges. Therefore, when Joshua and all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, the Bible records another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. That's from Judges chapter 2 verse 10. It was a generation who, remember, they knew not war. Judges chapter 3 verse 1. And therefore they became a little bit lax. Everything was given to them, handed to them. They didn't have to fight for it. And so that generation and after became very lax. That's the time we're reading about in the time of Judges. And so they began lax in their spiritual walk and turned to the pagan deities of the inhabitants around them, which they were forbidden to do all the way back in Moses' law there, that they were forbidden to do that, not to have any other gods before them. Remember, that's the first commandment. And so instead of evangelizing the world, they became like the world. And so God allowed them to be defeated by the pagan nations around them. And then they would cry out to the Lord. And the Lord would raise up a judge to deliver them. And after that, they were delivered. They would go back to worshiping God for a season. They would experience peace and prosperity for a little while, but only to get lax and fall again into idolatry. And so you can see the cycle there. Oftentimes, it's a cycle in our own lives. You ever find that happening in your own lives? You're the same old, same old. Kind of the ups and downs, but really we kind of cycle through the same old, same old. Well, that's really what's happening to Israel. It was a cycle, and we're right in the midst of that cycle with this fifth judge named Gideon. So last Wednesday, we saw Gideon's call. He wasn't a strong man. Remember that? Kind of questioned, a little bit timid. Wasn't a strong man, but unlike Barak, he, by faith, answered the call. Remember Barak, he didn't answer the call. He was the one that was called, but then he didn't want to go. And then who was raised up? Deborah. A woman was raised up. And so God raised up Deborah as a judge instead of him because he didn't answer the call. But you know, I kind of look at that. Barak and Gideon are similar. But the only difference is that Gideon, he answered the call. Barak didn't. And so we saw that in chapters 4 and 5, Barak. He denied it, and Deborah was raised up. But in chapter 6, last week, God called Gideon to be raised up from the tribe of Manasseh to deliver Manasseh from the Midianites. And so Gideon, being sort of timid and weak also, what did he do? He asked God to confirm his call. And there's nothing wrong with that, to ask God to confirm your call. And several times he asked him, and each and every time God did. Remember that fleece he put out? And so several confirmations that he received. And so now after the call and after all that confirmation in Judges 6, we now see the preparation for the actual battle in chapter 7 and chapter 8. And so we're going to be in reading right there. Chapter 7, verse 1 says, Then Yerubal, which is Gideon, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harah, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. Verse 2, and the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So an interesting insight into God's providence revealed in this second verse. And that insight is this, that God wants the glory. You notice that? Now what does it mean that God wants the glory? It means that he doesn't want you getting the glory. That's what it means. That's the application for us. God doesn't want you getting the glory for what he does. And I think this is something we need to pause and 
to really let sink into our thick heads. Now I say thick heads not to be funny, but to really identify an important truth that I think we need to all be aware of. And that is that I think it's our nature to always want to receive glory. What about you? I think it's in our nature. It comes natural. Let me share this with you. We love having people think well of us. Is that not getting glory? We're so occupied with what people think. I want people to think I'm smart. I want people to think I'm strong. All these things they reflect on us wanting to have glory. We like the glory. And for the most part, liking the glory is a function of what people think of us. Think about that. You feel glorified as people think highly of you. When others look up to us, we feel glory. Think about it. It makes a lot of sense. But the flip side is that when others look down on us, they think we're not so smart. They think we're unsuccessful, that we're losers or unspiritual. Then we feel what? Hurt and disrespected, don't we? And that is why in the natural man, we're always trying to receive glory because it helps us feel important. Like I'm good, I'm successful, I'm educated. I have a lot of money in the bank. See, that's what we respect and we get our glory from that. We like to prop ourselves up before others. But you know what, as a child of God, we need to give glory to God. And never, ever try to take credit for what God has done in us and through us. See, godliness never promotes self, does it? Godliness never promotes self. He always what? Godliness always promotes God. The one who's godly always promotes God. He always gives glory to God. And that's how it should be. It shouldn't be something only talked about, but something that's lived out. And you know how it's lived out? It's through humility, isn't it? When humility is true, humility is displayed. That's a person who is bowing and giving glory to God. And that is the principle being underscored here in verse two. It says, and the Lord said to Gideon, notice, the people are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim Glory for itself. Look how strong I am. You want people to think you're strong? Look how smart I am. You want people to think you're smart? Oftentimes that's rooted in wanting glory. And you know, the fact of the matter is, it doesn't really matter what people think, do they? It matters what God thinks and what God knows. So that's our struggle oftentimes. We're worried about what everybody else thinks because we want to be lifted up. God says, don't worry about that. You just serve and give glory to God. The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. You ever hear someone say that? I did this. I did that. Look at what I did. See, that's bring glory to ourselves. As a child of God, I don't know if you really realize this, but everything that you have is a gift from God. Do you know your very breath of life is a gift from God? Do you ever give glory to God for that? That you know, God, I can breathe. Because there's a lot of people that are struggling to breathe even now. I've never done hospital visitations. Prayed over somebody that's in intensive care, has a tube down their throat. You pray for them and you say, God, be glorified. Thank you that I'm able to be here and pray for them. And so oftentimes, right, we're always looking to receive glory. We may not identify it as such, but we need to give God the glory, even for the things that we're not so mindful of like a place to come to church, a place to study the Word of God, a place to sing songs to the Lord. Do you know that that's a gift? It's a gift that many in this world do not have? 
We need to give glory to God. Always give glory to God. And we need to let it be more than words. We need to let it be more than a good Bible study. It should be knitted in the very fabric of our hearts to give glory to God. Now, verse 3 says, Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And so here we go. The dwindling of the physical army. Two-thirds sent home. So God gets the glory. And actually, it's not dwindled enough. He's going to dwindle it even more. With 10,000, the natural man still might say, it's me. And so he's going to dwindle it down. She's going to take it down to 300. Can you imagine? Do you know a commander of the army that wants to dwindle his army? I don't know one that wants to. It seems to me the more, the stronger. But God says, no, the more, the less you're going to be dependent on me. And you're going to be tempted to give yourself the glory, not God. And so God is going to reduce the number to really an impossible feat physically. And he's going to do that so when they get the victory, they can only say, God be glorified. Have you ever experienced that? That God presents something before your life and you know, I can't do this. There's no way. But then God calls you to do it. And you take a step and you do it. And when you have the victory, you can know that only God did it. And you give God the glory. That's exactly what he's doing here. He's taking this army down to an impossibility. But all things are possible with who? God. And so God's going to get the glory. Now verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. Verse 5. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. So the ones who lapped like dogs were 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. So, the few who lap the water as a dog laps shall be set aside as the army that defeats the Midianites. Now, I'm not sure why those ones, maybe it's because dogs are faithful, huh, to their masters. Maybe once people are faithful. I don't know. I'm just kind of putting that out. It's probably not the reason. But nonetheless, it's a very small number, isn't it? 300. And he started with the thousands. 300 are going to go. And you're going to see that they're going to battle this army that is as numerous as the locusts. Crazy, isn't it? And God's going to give them the victory. Now, verse 7 says, Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Verse 8. And so the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Not the camp of Midian. Now, excuse me. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Verse 9. And it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. So I want you to notice once again, the word of the Lord comes to Gideon. Is he going to believe it? Well, he's going to believe it after some confirmation again. And again, it gives you insight into the nature of Gideon. He's a little bit timid, and he always wants confirmation. I can't, I can't uh, have a negative uh, thought about that because that's what we should be doing, right? We should always be asking for confirmation. That's what Gideon does. Asking once again for confirmation. The word of the Lord came to him. So Gideon is fearful, but he's going to get confirmation. Now let's think about this for a bit. While it is not a godly character to be fearful, it is a godly character to wait on the Lord, isn't it? And so this is an interesting dynamic. Gideon has a personality of fear. He really does. I don't know if you do too. 
And fear we know is not from God. However, God can, in someone's fear, reveal his word. God can still work. And that's what we see here. God continues to give Gideon his word, even with his fear. And then he confirms it time and time again. So I want you to notice that. You know, when you start to experience fear, you need to look to God's word. You really do. Because God will speak to you by his word. Might be in the word of God. Might be God will speak to you through the Holy Spirit. But God will give you a word to hang on to. You. And as you hang on to that word, fear will leave. And he'll confirm that word. We see that time and time again. But how are you going to know God's word if you don't see God for his word? And so I want you to notice this dynamic. He's fearful, but the word of God keeps coming to him and being confirmed to him time and time again. And the result is that by faith, Gideon ultimately does what the Lord called him to do. And he leads the battle and the deliverance of Israel in God's way and in God's time. But think about this. What if Gideon was the impulsive type? Anybody here the impulsive type? Kind of self-confident type? Think about it. He may not have waited on the Lord, huh? May not have waited for confirmation. Oftentimes we get a little bit impulsive. And we hear in God's word what we want to hear. We don't wait on it. And that could be a mistake as well. So even in Gideon's timidness, God used it to fulfill his word. And this to me underscores the sovereignty of God working through willing hearts. His heart was willing, no matter his personality. If your heart is willing, and you're willing to really wait on the Lord for confirmation, he'll give it to you. You don't have to seek after it. So there's a flip side to it, right? You're timid, and you're waiting for God's word to confirm. But then there's also people that are impulsive. They want something. And they go after it, even before God's word has come to them. Perhaps they're actually making it up. But I got to tell you, you know when God's word goes out. You know it. You'll know it. It'll be very, very clear if you're able to wait on it. But once it comes, you better go. He's giving you that confirmation. You go. And you believe God for his word. Now, verse 10. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp of Pura. Your servant, verse 11, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. That is, go down and get confirmation and end the enemy camp, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened. Verse 11, then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. Verse 12, now the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. That's a big army numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number. You couldn't even count them as the sand by the seashore in multitude. So notice the odds were greatly against them, the physical. An army of 300 men versus an army as numerous as locusts and camels without number. The odds are against them, but they have God's word. Gideon and his men are right where the Lord wants them to be. They are smack dab in the middle of God's plan. And I gotta tell you people, you wanna be smack dab in the middle of God's plan. Because you can be sure that God's plan is gonna go forward. So God gives you his word, he confirms the word, then you're in God's plan, and you move forward in faith, and you know what? It's gonna come to pass. Now verse 13. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. And he said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Now, I want you to note this, that this dream is from within the camp of the enemy, the Midianites. And Gideon is right there to hear it. This is yet another radical confirmation of God's word, even through the enemy camp. That's kind of an interesting thing. And I do believe that it happens. There's application. God will confirm his word to you in a clear way. And sometimes he'll even do it through the world. See, you don't have to search for it or make it up or anything like that. God will confirm in a clear way and a powerful way. And when he does, you best follow. But oftentimes he's going to reveal his word to you, even 
in situations outside of the fellowship. I don't know if you ever had that happen. It could be at your job, your secular job. It could be hanging out with your secular coworkers, right? On the job, you're doing something and there's something that confirms it to you. But God has given you his word and he's able to confirm it. And this is exactly what we see here. In the enemy camp, he confirmed the word to Gideon. So you know that they're not making it up. It's in the enemy camp. Now verse 14. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing. This is in the enemy camp. This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. So another interesting dynamic. The word of God confirmed within the camp of the Midianites. Do they know God's word? Absolutely not. But Gideon does. And so God can actually speak through the world, and he does oftentimes. He does. Now, if we're in God's word, and we see the world doing things to confirm God's word, there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, that happens oftentimes. And this is exactly what's happening here. And so, Something that said and happens in the world can confirm God's word, and even personally. He can use even a pagan person or a pagan place to confirm his word to you. He does that oftentimes, and this is what we see here. Now, verse 15, and so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshiped. He worshiped, why? Because he knew God's word was confirmed. First thing he did is praise the Lord. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hands. So you see at the confirmation of God's word, what does he do? He starts to go forth in faith. The confirmation he needed is affirmed. And now the going forth into battle by faith. And so once God confirms his word to you, you need to go. There's the waiting on the Lord, but then there's also going. You wait for the word. Don't try to, you know, if you're a little bit impulsive, don't try to orchestrate God's word. That can get you in big trouble. You wait for his word. It'll be clear. And once it's clear, against all odds, you go. If God before you, you know, nobody can work it against you. And he's going to make the way. And so the confirmation is there, and then he's going to go in faith. Now, verse 16. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, and I... When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So the plan is to attack from three different sides, 100 men from each side. They are to blow the trumpets to initiate the attack and then in unison cry out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now verse 9 says, so Gideon... And the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Verse 20. Then the three com companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. <laughs> Verse 22. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. This is the enemy camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia toward Zerorah, as far as the border of Abel, Mahola, and Tabath. And so when the trumpets of Gideon's army blew, it totally surprised the Midian camp. And they, in their surprise and shock, they began to slay each other. It's probably dark. You couldn't see real well. And as they blew that, they didn't know who were the enemies. And so they started to fight against themselves. 
It says, Then the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And so it was the Lord who was behind the confusion, wasn't it? It was the Lord who was battling for Gideon. And I'd love to just kind of mark that to you. The Lord goes before you in the battle. Now, verse 23. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, all of Manasseh, and pursued the Midians. Now I want you to notice here the tribes, the other tribes getting involved. Naphtali and Asher. Now verse 24. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Barah, and the Jordan. Then all the men of, Ge of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. Verse 25. And they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Now let's go and finish this up in Judges chapter 8. Verse 1 says, Now the men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you fight, when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded Gideon sharply. So this is kind of an interesting thing to note here. Kind of after the battle's done. Now there's still some residue we're going to see. Then you got all these guys coming. Why didn't you call us? Thanks for nothing, huh? <laughs> Now that the Midianites, they're on the run now. And so you have this tribe of Ephraim, now they're ready to fight. So pretty much the Lord has already brought the victory, except for the Midian kings. They're still at large and they're still fleeing. However, most of the battle is already won. And now the Ephraimites, they reprimand Gideon saying, why didn't you call us? Now I love Gideon's response. It wasn't like what I just responded. Thanks for nothing. He didn't say that, did he? Well, he wasn't naturally courageous. Though he was spiritually, as we've seen. But he does know how to communicate as a leader. I want you to notice that. Notice in verse 2 his response. He says, so he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? He didn't say thanks for nothing. He knew how to communicate. And this people is very important. Especially when you lead a family, when you lead people, you need to know how to communicate. Because oftentimes our words dismantle the work of God. Are you with me on that? You ever kind of say something you said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I did it again. Oftentimes we do that, huh? And you can't take them back. So he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? So what does that mean? Well, since Gideon is an Abiezrite, when he says the vintage of Abiezer, he is referring to himself. So what he is saying is that you Ephraimites have done way more in the aftermath of the battle than I have done in the battle. That's what he's saying. Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim what you've done? That's a reference to the after battle, which they're in now. The cleanup. The finishing up of the battle. So notice what Gideon does here is to give them encouragement. Matter of fact, give them the glory in a way. Which they like. Even though Gideon knows that God gets the glory. But that is sometimes how one needs to communicate. If someone is upset with not getting recognized, then you know what you do? Recognize him. Because in the end, God recognizes everything anyway. What is true and what is not. But if in victory others need to be recognized before yourself, then do it. Recognize them before yourself to keep the peace. Is this not what Gideon's doing? The victory is the Lord's. Gideon knows what he's called to do. Gideon knows what he's done. Now these other ones are coming in. Hey, why don't you call us? 
and said, hey, you know, you guys have done a good job in the aftermath. And so he encourages them. No harm, no fall, no foul, just maturity. Right here we see Gideon, he's mature in how he communicates. He doesn't have to receive one bit of glory. He doesn't have to receive one pat on the back. God knows. And I think that's what's happening here. Gideon, he's a gifted communicator. Maybe not too courageous, but he's a gifted communicator, especially in the victory. Now, verse 3. God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what I was able to do in comparison with you, see his gift communication here? What I was able to do doesn't compare to what you did. And they feel really good. Notice verse 3. Then their anger toward him subdued or subsided when he said that. And I just have to smile. Because often I mean, you can read people like a book. This is what happens. You give them a little bit of glory. Oh, my goodness. You got peace. No harm, no foul. Just maturity. That's what it is. And so we see how Gideon handles this situation very well. A lot of wisdom. And so verse 4. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. Verse 5, then he said to the men of Sukkoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted, and I am pursuing Zabah and Zalmunah, kings of Midian. And the leaders of Sukkoth said, are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunah now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? Now, it's not known for sure why the leaders of Sukkoth reacted this way, why they didn't help Gideon and his army by just giving him some bread. But they see that the Midian kings are on the run. And perhaps they didn't have confidence in Gideon to finish the job. Perhaps they heard about Gideon, maybe not too courageous. It's possible. Because if he hadn't finished the job, they would have to deal with the Midian kings. So you can see, kind of read between the lines what's happening here. Maybe they don't want to give him bread because they think that he's not going to finish his job. The Midianite kings are going to come back and say, why did you feed them? See where I'm going there? They didn't have too much confidence in Gideon. And so this is no doubt another test for Gideon, particularly if the leaders of Sukkot didn't have confidence in him. But notice Gideon's response. No longer a response of a weak man, but a strong one. And that's what following God's word does. Following God's word will make you strong. It'll make you not give a rip what people think or say. And that's a position of strength. If you give glory to people, if you're worried about your own glory, if you worry about what people think, you'll become a weak person. And God wants to strip you of that. It's not that you become a rebel. As you become under the word of God. And that's all that matters. That's what makes you strong. And so we see Gideon from a weak to a strong man because he's given now God the glory. Verse 7, so Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with the briars. A little bit different, isn't he? <laughs> After following the word of God. And you think he's going to do it? Oh, you better believe he is. He's different. He's giving glory to God. Now verse 8, then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered. And so it would seem that the other leaders in the area didn't have much faith in Gideon finishing the work as well. Perhaps they too had heard that Gideon is a very timid man, may not defeat the Midianite kings.
And so verse 9. So he also spoke to them in a penuel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. Verse 10. Now Zeba and Salmuna were at Karkor, and their armies with them, about 15,000, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. <laughs> it's a big army. And so this is the aftermath, as I mentioned. 120,000 already fallen because of these 300 men walking in God's word. But there's still some work to do, some residue to clean out. Now, verse 11, then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in tents on the east of Nobah and Yagbeha. And he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. Verse 12, when Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them. And he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. Verse 13, then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Harris. And he caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth and interrogated him. And he wrote down for him the leaders of Sukkoth and its elders. 77 men, verse 15, then he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, here are Zeba and Zalmunna about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? Verse 16, And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. Then he tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. Doesn't sound too timid to me anymore. Verse 18. And he said to Ziba and Zalmunna, What kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? And so they answered, As you are, so were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Verse 19. Then he said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Yether, his firstborn, this would be Gideon's firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. You ever hear the phrase, like father, like son? That's probably what's happening here. We can see here that Yether, his firstborn, was just like him in the natural not too courageous, a bit timid. But I think that that underscores what God can do in a person. It's almost like the before and the after. And oftentimes the timid and not too courageous in the natural are the very one God raises up to do supernatural things. And that's what he did with Gideon. Perhaps that's what he would do to his firstborn, his son. But you can see, like father, like son, in the natural, didn't have the courage to do it. And so God would change Gideon from that to what he is now, to defeat an enormous army of just 300 people, 300 men. God changed Gideon by his word. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. I'm going to read this again. I read this last week. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty. Gideon wasn't too mighty. Not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. When Gideon won the battle, who gets the glory? Surely can't be Gideon. The guy didn't have any courage before. God gets the glory. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, Paul writes and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. 
always give glory to God. Never take God's glory. Always give glory to God, and he'll lift you up. That's the bottom line. God gets the glory. Verse 21. So Zeba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and kill us, to Gideon. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna. They probably had heard how weak Gideon was. And I didn't think he was going to do it. Just like the other nations. Is he going to finish his job? I know him. I noticed what he did. And he took the crescent ornaments that were in on their camel's necks. So no problem, right? It says, rise yourself and kill us, for as a man is so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed them and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camels. Like he had no problem doing the word of God. He has been changed from weak, the weak things of the world, to mighty in God. Transformation, Gideon. Now verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now remember, as we noted previously, this was a time of no kings. Because who was the king? God was to be their king. Men kings don't really cut it, do they? Can you imagine if this world all just saw God as king? We wouldn't have any men kings or women kings. God would be our king. Can you imagine? That was what the design was for Israel. Men kings really don't cut it. The only king that works is God as king. When God rules and reigns in our lives as king, that's the only king we need. Because men kings are what? Fallible, aren't they? They disappoint us. And we see that even here in the next verses in Gideon. We're going to see this in Gideon. As great as his victory was, he's fallible, isn't he? And I think this shows the wisdom in having no human kings. That God is the only true king up for the job. Because notice in verse 24, the fallibility in Gideon. And notice it comes right after he said, No, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. This is, interestingly enough, a prophetic word. Because notice the next verse, verse 24. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you, that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. What? For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. What? What happened? Oh, well, you know what happened? Reality happened. And you know what? Let's be honest. It happens to all of us. Ever see a godly man fall? It happens. It happens a lot. Ever see a godly woman fall? It happens. It happens a lot. Reality happens. You know, none of us should ever think that we're some kind of infallible Christian or leader because there doesn't exist one. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Is that biblical? And so don't ever put a person on a pedestal because they're a sinner just like you and me. Fallible. The only one you lift up is Jesus. It's the only one. As fast as you look up to a man and a woman, as fast as they can fall. You gotta look to Jesus. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 25, so they answered, we will gladly give them and they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now, verse 26, the weight of the gold earrings that 
he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian. And besides the chains, they were all around the camel's necks. Now, notice the precious metals. Notice the money. And you know, more than ever before in my walk of faith, more than ever before, this principle has really rung out true in my heart that the love of money is the root of all evil. More than ever before. You know what you see people do with money? Even Christians, it will astound you. Those are Jesus' words, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And I just would um, quote scripture, receive it for what it is. But the warning is, don't let money get in the way of your relationship with God. I know that sounds almost cliche, but it happens so often so often and it happens to Christians and so look he saw this the monetary value and it drew him away these are the ornaments of the world they are worldly attractions to the senses and such is the case today the worldly desires that tempt our senses draw us away from our God. And so notice this, after Gideon's great victory came this great defeat. And you know what, people? I'll just make this personal. That can happen to me. So you pray for your pastor. I'm no better than anybody else. That can happen to me. That could be me. And that could be you. Never underestimate the power of this world. What a great, great disappointment. Experience the spoils of victory is the time when temptation is the greatest, isn't it? And thus the cycle of Israel continues. It wouldn't be long in this victory and rest before another judge would need to be raised up to deliver them from the fall. Verse 27, then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up on his city, Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot with it. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Verse 29, then Rubal, Herubal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Verse 30, Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash's father, in Ophrah, of the Abizrites. So it was, verse 33, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal bereath their God. Verse 34, thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Yerubal, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. And the cycle continues. Will they ever learn? Good question. Will they ever learn? Well, it's a question that we can answer by reading forward in scripture. We can answer it. They never learned. 
except for a small remnant. Let's look at the question, does will we ever learn? It's a good question for us. Will we ever learn? Or is it the same old, same old? But you know what the difference is? Is that we have yet to see the outcome. We have yet to know the answer to that question. But it's a question you and I should ponder. Will we ever learn? Or is it the same old, same old? Where will you be a year from now? Where will you be five years from now? What about 10 or 20 years from now? Will you be doing the same things? Or will you be moving forward? It's a good question. We can see right here in scripture, the cycle never ends. But the question remains to be seen for us. And I just would encourage you, I believe it's in the day-to-day. -day. No matter what season of life you're in, it's in the day-to-day. -day. Are we faithful to be in God's word daily? Are we faithful to be in prayer daily? Are we faithful to be worshiping daily? Day-to-day. -day. Are we faithful to be in fellowship with God's people regularly? Because you see, the day-to-day -day leads to week-to-week, -to -week, doesn't it? And month to month, and then year to year, and then a season to season. It's a race, isn't it? The scriptures record. It's a long distance race. And as you establish these things in your life, worship, prayer, God's word, and godly fellowship, these are things that move you upward and forward so that you don't remain in a cycle, going around in circles, in the same old, same old. Don't let your life be the same old, same old. The old is not the good way. We have a new way, don't we? Move upward and forward as you look to your Lord in these ways. Worship, prayer, God's word, and godly fellowship. The day-to-day, -day, do it. And you'll see changes in your life. Changes that make a difference. Let's pray, Lord. We thank you for your word. Help us, I pray. For some of us, Lord, it's a cycle that is a very vicious one. And we can relate to the cycle that Israel's in. And the chances that you've given them to get out of that cycle and I believe for many of us, you've given us many chances. And Lord, as I mentioned, just the question is not answered in our lives. It is for Israel, at least for that season of time. But it's not for our lives. And so I pray for anyone here, Lord, that is in that cycle, when they recognize it. But I pray that you would reveal to them that you would reckon them to the truth a truth that you want to show them and reveal to them in a very deep way so that they don't destroy their lives. That their lives would be used in a powerful way for the kingdom. And so help us, I pray, to learn from these scriptures, to learn these lessons, O Lord, that we might, by faith, walk this new life. New life that you've given us in the spirit. It's a great life more valuable than silver and gold. This earth is passing away, but your life grows and grows and grows until we see you face to face. It's a wonderful life. Help us to enter in and to invest in that life, life eternal. I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.